so, so yeah, so thanks. I, I want to start by thanking Bill Hoffman, my colleague. Um, Bill and I have been working to get this this uh, crew together for the the year, and it's and it's a, it's an honor that they've come. And um, this, I think, is going. I think perhaps one of the most important things we do before we uh, before we introduce them. I want to introduce those of you who are not part of the Maxillofacial Society. So I've I've invited a number of people to be here. So we represent our different major organizations in plastic surgery that are focused on education, and, and, and it's great that we have that representation. So we are the American Society of Maxillofacial Surgeons. We are the ones who deal with, um, deal with uh, education related to maxillofacial and a lot of pediatric plastic surgery. Um, and a lot of the people here are program directors are very heavily involved in resident education, um, not only from that perspective, but from all of plastic surgery. The, we've, I've invited a, a representative from the ACAPS, the American Council of Academic Plastic Surgeons, Tony Smith, who, um, who is going to be, as, as mentioned to you, is going to look into a winter retreat where we expand on some of these topics so that the program directors have access to the, to the information that you're giving. Um, and so, Tony, thanks for coming. The, and then I've also invited a representative from the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, Mike Costello, uh, in the back there, and Mike is the um, the executive director of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, and really those are our major and the PS Plastic Surgery Foundation, and those are our major educational arms. If you think of ACAPS, um, the ASPS, PSF, and and the subspecialty arms, and we're one of the subspecialty arms. So I think this is a good way to get the message across, so people are consistent in understanding the concepts in resident education. Um, so I want to introduce our speakers, and we're going to have it so that they each speak to you, and then we'll finish with an interactive panel. And we're going to focus on uh, the future directions in resident education to look at the development of the next accreditation system, the current state of the milestones project, and ways for, uh, for really objectively assessing resident assessment or, or evaluating resident assessment as they go through a graded training program. And then lastly, we would like to look at are there alternative ways to perhaps train them and assess them and the role for virtual surgery. So in, in, in taking those roles, we have um, three, three of the vice presidents from the ACGME, Stan Hamstra um, over here, who is vice president of Milestone Research and, 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 and Evaluation. Um, then we have Eric Hombo right here, and he's senior vice president for Milestone Development and Evaluation and then John Potts, um, who is the Senior Vice President of Surgical Education. So all from the ACGME. And then we have um, Andrew Cho, Choi, and, uh, or is it Andrew Chow? I've just met Chow, sorry. And from Touch Surgery. And Gene Nemi and Andrew Chow have worked together as co-founders of that project. And um, they were gracious enough to come to give that alternative model to surgical education. So we're going to have them present in sequence, and then we will open it up to panel discussion. So let's start with um, John. And John's going to talk about development and supervision of graded resident responsibility. Is that OK with you, John? Well, good morning, everybody. Um, certainly a pleasure to be here on a nice uh, Chicago summer afternoon. It's nothing, I spent 21 years in Houston, and this is nothing like summer to me, but, but this is summer in Chicago, so that's, uh, that's what we have. Uh, by way of disclosure, I, I always do confess to audiences that I am in recovery. Uh, I spent 21 years as a general surgery program director before I came to the ACGME, so I am still in recovery. Um, I am an ACGME employee and uh, do uh, have my fiduciary role at ACGME, but uh, want to emphasize that today I'm not speaking for the ACGME, I'm speaking for myself. And of course, since I've been in education my entire career, 
I have no financial disclosures. Um, how many of you are private pilots? Oh, I wish someone would raise their hand because <laughs> there's a lot of this talk that kind of hinges on that. Um, well, I, I'll raise my hand. I have a private pilot's license. I don't fly anymore, but I do have a license. Uh, we'll come back to this. We'll come back to this. So, uh, by way of background, uh, and please note the, uh, the footnote at the bottom. I am heavily influenced by what's happening in general surgery. That is my, my background. But this is true of all specialties. Um, surveys of residents, recent graduates, practicing physicians, hospital administrators, and lots of other data indicates that residency does not prepare people well for independent practice. That's just a fact. So why aren't they prepared? Well, you know, the substrate we get from medical schools is not what it used to be. Um, many, many medical schools have completely done away with in-house call, for instance. And students, because of electronic medical records and other reasons, aren't even allowed to write notes uh, in the chart as we used to do. Uh, many other things about medical school just does not prepare individuals for residency the way that they were previously prepared for residency. Um, even though I work at the ACGME, I think we all recognize that duty hour limitations are at least frequently blamed for these issues and probably do have some role in lack of resident preparation. Another one is that residency is hospital-based. Uh, now, that has to do with Medicare billing rules and a bunch of other things, but that's not where the practice of surgery is concentrated for most folks, and I, I think that's probably particularly true in the world of plastic surgery. It's not hospital-based. It may be in an operating room, but those operating rooms, by and large, are not in the hospital. Nevertheless, that's where we have to base our residences. Uh, maybe or maybe not so much in plastic surgery, but in a lot of different disciplines, uh, there have been changes in the surgical conditions, diseases that we operate, uh, influenced by medical treatment and so forth. And there's certainly been changing technology, and I know that's true in plastic surgery just like it is in any other surgical specialty. And our curricula have lagged behind those changes. Um, and that's assuming that we've got curricula. <laughs> uh, some specialties have worked very hard to create national curricula, uh, but every program is supposed to have its own curriculum, and I think those curricula have lagged behind many of these changes. And there's certainly a lack of faculty development. I can congratulate the Plastic Surgery Review Committee in that several years ago they added a requirement regarding faculty development. Most program requirements in most specialties do not have any requirement for faculty development. Plastic sort of led the way on that and I think is modifying it to make it even a little bit more stringent. Uh, but we're going to come back to that one too. I think the major factor though in lack of preparation of our residency graduates for independent practice is that they don't get appropriate supervision during their residency. I'm going to expand on that. Certainly the residents don't run amok, right? They shouldn't and they don't run amok in our programs. They are very heavily supervised, very heavily supervised in almost everything that they do in almost every program. I would argue, though, that they're not appropriately supervised. You know, a PGY-1, brand new, minted PGY-1 out of one of these medical schools probably should be under direct supervision for almost everything that they do. That would be appropriate supervision for that level of resident. But a PGY, fill in the blank on the year, depending on the residency program, the final year, 
of preparation going out into practice should be indirectly supervised, almost all the time. Very little that they do should require direct supervision. And I would argue that at any resident level, if one has successfully demonstrated uh, competency at a given task, those individuals should be allowed to do that task with indirect supervision almost all the time. And that's not happening in our residency programs. I think appropriate supervision of residents is vanishingly rare in our programs. Uh, I go speak to a number of different organizations and, and, and sites, program sites. And I've actually encountered a number of chief residents, chief general surgery residents, fifth year of training, spring of their fifth year of training, who have never been in an operating room without the attending scrub. Never been in an OR without the attending scrub. Um, I think that's not appropriate supervision of those residents. This loss of autonomy um, is longstanding. It's been insidious. Uh, I tend to date this back to this thing called IL 372, uh, which was written in 1969 about Medicare billing rules for teaching physicians, which led to the path audits in the mid 90s. Um, we talked about this at dinner a little bit last night. University of Pennsylvania paid $30 million. Pittsburgh paid $17 million. Thomas Jefferson paid $12 million to the feds for what was perceived to be uh, inappropriate billing for attending surgeons and physicians uh, uh, who were supervising residents. Well, you know, that scared the bejesus out of deans, among others, who said, hey, you know, they misinterpreted this. Instead of saying, well, you need to properly submit the bills for the things that you did, Instead of saying that, many deans turned to their faculty and said, you have got to directly supervise the residents. You have got to be there every minute. Now, that's not what the Medicare billing rules call for, but that was the message that was given to faculty members. Patient safety movement. Please understand I'm all in favor of patient safety. Uh, patient safety movement has been around for a long time. I think. Uh, um, Certainly, it got a boost in 1999 with the publication of Two Errors Human, but it had been around before that. But it's kind of gone amok as well. CMS came out in 2008 with their never events, uh, for which the hospital is not paid for the entire stay if one of these never events occurs. That list has now expanded to, I think, 18 items. If one of those events occurs in a Medicare patient, no payment to the hospital for that hospital stay, regardless of what the comorbid factors or the length of the stay or anything else might be in that patient. Well, that gets the hospital administrator's attention, and they too then go to the faculty and say, hey, you know what, you've got to be there when the Foley catheter is introduced because we don't want a catheter infection. You know, that kind of stuff. I'm a little bit apologetic in, in presenting the next one to a subspecialty society, but I think that the, the burgeoning subspecialty training, uh, certainly in general surgery, I think in internal medicine, I think in a lot of specialties, has been harmful uh, to residency education. And I'll, I'll talk about that more in a minute, but, but there are several factors here. One is, it's inevitable that residents who are aiming at a subspecialty begin to set that aim very early and say, well, you know, these things aren't important to me because I'm going to be a right upper parathyroid surgeon, so I don't really need to do trauma. Uh, and they just don't put their heart into those activities. It also has an effect on the faculty. Faculty say, hey, you know, he's going to be a right upper parathyroid surgeon, so 
I don't want to teach him pancreatic surgery. I'm going to teach pancreatic surgery to somebody who's going to learn pancreatic surgery and do pancreatic surgery. It also takes the best teachers in those subspecialties away from the residents. They're concentrating their efforts on the fellows in those subspecialties rather than concentrating on the residents. So I, I think subspecialty training in, our, in association with our programs uh, really brings several problems. Growth in the number of faculty, you'd think that would be a good thing, you know. Uh, that would be the sort of knee-jerk response to that. AAMC data indicates that over the last decade, there's been almost a 40% increase in the number of surgical faculty in our medical schools. Over 10 years, almost a 40% increase in the number of faculty. Again, it sounds good, and then you think about the implications of that for the resident. There are more faculty to know they have to run from case to case to case to case so that every faculty member's cases are covered. The faculty members don't know them when they come to the operating room. They haven't really worked with them in a concentrated way. So the residents are not given the opportunity to do what they can really do. They're not given the opportunity to get really good feedback. They're not given the opportunity even to be evaluated, and I know that Eric and Stan are going to talk about those things. So the growth in the number of faculty, I think, is problematic. I don't have to tell this audience, faculty are stretched. You've got academic responsibilities. You've got administrative responsibilities. You've got research responsibilities. You've got responsibilities to organizations like this. Uh, you've got your own CME and MOC to take care of. And um, ever-increasing demand for RBUs. So the faculty are stretched, and that's a problem. Quality metrics. Uh, again, I can't speak to your specific society and, and the operations that you do, but, but the quality metrics <clears throat> in many surgical specialties have such a narrow band that surgeons can't feel like they can't allow residents to do operations, even under their guidance, because if something goes wrong, they're going to fall off those quality metrics. So that's, a, that's an issue. The result is that after, you know, fill in the blank number of years of residency education, the graduates lack the technical ability, the judgment, and the confidence to go out into independent practice. So what are the solutions? Well, there's no one magic bullet. Um, but I think there are several things that could take place to improve this situation. I think uh, Eric and Stan may speak to this, but to the extent that it can be done, resident rotation should be lengthened. Uh, not so much a problem in surgical specialties as it is in the medical and pediatric specialties. Nevertheless, it is a problem in some surgical specialties. The rotation schedule is set up as a service to the hospital schedule, not with resident education in mind. Longer rotations allow better knowledge by the faculty of that resident's performance, better feedback, better evaluation, uh, so forth. So lengthen the resident rotations. Every program has a supervision policy. I would, I would challenge you, though, to say that I'll bet your supervision policy for your residents does not say when they should or must operate with indirect supervision. It may say when they can, but I'll bet it doesn't say when they should or must. So I think those can be rewritten to promote resident autonomy require the senior residents to act as teaching assistant for the junior residents. To teach is to learn twice and think back to when you first taught a procedure. I suspect that all of a sudden you felt like you didn't know that operation quite as well as you thought you did when somebody was teaching you. 
you really learn by doing that. And it's better for the residents to learn their areas of deficiency while they're in that protected environment of the residency program before they go out into independent practice and they're standing alone in the operating room at 2 a.m. We have to demand honest feedback, honest evaluation from our faculty. Uh, you, you've all been there. You get the evaluation form where this guy's a five out of five, and then you go to the faculty meeting to discuss that resident, and he's horrible. He's got hands of death and destruction when you're talking about it, but on the evaluation form, he's a five. Well, because, you know, I don't want to be sued, blah, 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 blah. We need to demand honest evaluation from our faculty, and I think you're going to hear more about that from Stan and Eric as well. And then we have to critically evaluate the teaching faculty. There's no question that programs have individuals who probably shouldn't be on the teaching faculty. They don't turn in evaluations. They don't turn in honest evaluations. Uh, you know, they don't let the residents do operations independently and so forth. Those teaching faculty need to be honestly evaluated and either kept on the teaching faculty or not. Um, I think it's important to limit those other learners, those fellows, uh, for the residency programs. Again, <clears throat> sort of shooting myself in the foot, talking to a subspecialty society, but I, I think it's important for resident education. Enhanced faculty development, uh, you're going to hear more about that, but most of our faculty have never attended a single hour's lecture on giving feedback. Most of them have never heard even an hour's lecture on evaluation. Most of them have never sat with the milestones, for instance, and, and said with your other faculty members, how do we view these milestones? What's our shared mental model of what this milestone means and, and how we will evaluate our residents in this program using those milestones? A couple of little things that they need education on are Medicare billing rules. You know, a lot of faculty members use those Medicare billing rules as an excuse for not letting residents do things with indirect supervision. The Medicare billing rules do allow that, absolutely. They absolutely allow it. All you've got to do is attest that you were present for key portions of the operation. Doesn't say scrubbed, doesn't say did it yourself. You have to be present for the key portions of the operation. What are the key portions of the operation? That's your decision. That's the call of the surgeon. And I think ACGME supervision policies, um, the faculty need to understand those. Our, our supervision policies actually encourage graded responsibility for the residents. They do not discourage it. They encourage that graded supervision. And finally, uh, I think Faculty should be paid for their teaching. That's a tough one, but that's when people are going to really start paying attention to it and doing it well. It's when they're paid for it. Um, some other things have to happen. There has to be a real commitment to training the future generation of surgeons by every level, each faculty member, each program director, each department chair, each hospital CEO, medical schools for most of us, and the public. The public have to understand the importance of training the next generation of surgeons. So it's my belief that the entire House of Surgery, beginning with every individual faculty member, up to the academies, the American College of Surgeons, and everything in between, need to educate the deans of our medical schools, need to educate the CEOs of our hospitals about the importance of training the next generation of surgeons and what's involved in that. Appropriate resident supervision. Yes, that may slightly decrease RVU production. It takes time to teach. Yes, there may be a slight diminution in the quality metrics, but these are good returns on investment. 
You're going to have better surgeons in your hospital. You're going to have better surgeons in your medical school in the future if you do that today. And the public needs to understand this. The public needs to understand this. Again, I think the academies and the college and so forth can play a role in this, but every surgeon, every teaching surgeon can help in, uh, educate the individual patient about the importance of appropriate resident supervision. We're not throwing away patient safety. That's, that's not where we're going with this. We can still ensure patient safety. The balance that has to be struck is the safety of one patient today versus the safety of all the patients that a graduate of your program is going to operate in the future. That's the balance that has to be struck. There's no easy answer there. But that's what we're balancing. If we turn out residents who are not prepared for independent practice, they're going to put other patients at risk going forward. I think with these things, we can provide the best surgical training in the world, we can provide the best surgical care in the world, and we can preserve our profession. If we don't do these things, uh, we won't have the best training in the world. We won't have the best care in the world going forward. So I want to go back to the private pilot thing, which doesn't relate to any of you. <laughs> and I'll just tell you, you know, um, you don't get a pilot's license after attending ground school, right? You just don't. You don't get a pilot's license after attending ground school. And you don't get a, a pilot's license after watching your instructor fly the plane. And indeed, you don't get a pilot's license after the instructor watches you fly the plane. There comes a day, if any of you ever do get a license, you'll understand this, when you're kind of doing touch and goes with your instructor and all of a sudden he says, come to a full stop on the runway. So you do. And he hops out of the plane and says, do five takeoffs and landings. That's a little tightening of certain areas when that occurs. So that's your solo flight. Well, you don't get a license then either. You have to go do some cross-country flights where you land in multiple airports and these are documented by uh, individuals on the ground in those airports and so forth. And finally, you have to take a check ride with the FAA examiner uh, before you can get an independent license. But my point is, you have gotta fly solo. And our residents have to fly solo while they're still in training, before they're given the license to go out and operate independently. They have to fly solo. With appropriate supervision, with appropriate evaluation and so forth, but they have got to fly solo. So with that, I'll stop and turn it over to my colleagues. Who's next? <laughs>